Welcome to episode 9 of season 3 of Relics of War. I am your host, Shongaku, and today I am joined by Eevee. Holy smokes, look at the size of Eevee's face. We're just going to go back to the main screen, because that's terrifying. How are you doing today, Eevee? I'm doing pretty good. I'm excited with all this new cutthroat politics stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, it's pretty rough. Manager. First of all, though... There's been a lot of stuff that's been coming out in Guild Wars 2, and one of the big things is they just released, well, big things, it's not really huge, uh, but they did another one of their, oh, you bought gems at some point in time? Well, here, have something for free. What'd they give us, Evie? Kites. Kites. But what can but you... But I wouldn't know about that because I'm poor and I don't have a kite. I got a kite. I got a sun kite. Apparently you got a random kite. It was either a sun kite or a lightning kite or a wind kite. Or a cloud kite, you could say. And so you get one of the two. So one was purple, one was red, one was light blue. The uh, interesting thing is you can upgrade them to guild kites for 15 gold. So if you had 15 gold, you could, uh, yeah, you could get a guild kite, which I may do, actually. And then I may, they're, they're like 500 gems, so they're like 6, 7 bucks. So I'm not sure if I'm going to do that, because I kind of like my fire kite. And I don't want to buy a complete set. Unless they sell the complete set for like 500 I don't know. It's a sun kite, not a fire kite. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Eh, sun, fire, wind, not the same. cloud. Eh. Not the same. There, there is a... Yeah, it's true. So, have, so you don't have a kite. That's sad. Because the kites are amazing. Have you seen what the kites get... What, what the coolest thing that the kites do is? You can use them with any transformation? Yes, indeed. Have you seen the baby quaggins with kites? I've seen a giant spider holding a kite the size of the bank. <laughs> how did... What? How? I have no idea how it happened. So but there's that... The thing. I think you can use the uh, growth technique on from a, a ranger. Or perhaps the uh, warrior berserker type. Where there's that, where you hulk out and you get bigger. And then you do that on a Norn, and then you combine it with a tonic. And that should actually possibly make you. And then I think there's. And then you probably try and combine that with the. Uh, with the. Mushrooms that you get in Kaladon Forest. And you just stack as many growth. Separate growth techniques as possible, and bam! Giant spider with a kite the size of the bank. That's amazing. Wow. But I do like all the pictures. I actually, I think the pictures that have been showing up on like Reddit and stuff of just like lines of little quaggin with little kites marching across various areas is hilarious. I, I think, think it's the like, best ones are of people jumping off the Zephyr Sanctum with the kite. That's actually pretty awesome. Like get an entire stream of them and then film from below as they're doing the best dive Especially ever. Especially because when you're falling from a long distance... The kite seems to trail these, like, things from the corners that you only see when you fall long enough. Oh, really? Oh, they get... Because when a, hu when a, when a character falls, they start getting those uh, wind trails. So they must do that with the kites, too, because the kites have physics applied to them, which I think is fantastic. Another crazy thing I saw with the kites is you can do the spinning glitch with a greatsword where you just spin, 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 and then equip the, the kite during that animation, and then your character will just be spinning, and the kite will just... They're pretty fantastic. I think that they're... I approve of the kites. I think... And, it, you know, it was actually a fairly brilliant strategy, is the day before they started selling kites, they gave them away for free. Mm -hmm. And so then all of a sudden all these people see these kites and they see kites everywhere and they're like, where do I get this? And they start asking questions and then all of a sudden, bam, the next day, you can buy them in the gem store. And they've already seen how crazy fun these things are. And by fun, I mean sandbox fun, not necessarily gameplay mm -hmm. fun. So I approve Good Work Arena Net, excellent way to uh, basically have the player base market to themselves. 
And see, now you need to spend like five bucks on gems every month, Eevee, so that you'll have... So you'll be able to get the free stuff. Because totally worth it for a kite, right? Yes? No? No? Okay. So moving on to the actual huge stuff of the week, we have a massive uh, politics season is, is starting up, and people are going to be voting for the next counselor. How is how old is who is who's in the running? I think most people have done the story know, but who's in the running? Give us some background on that and sort of how it's gonna how you're gonna vote. Okay, so we have two candidates. They are currently captains because only captains can get the spot. Very very important, and they are Evan Nashblade, which is the head of the Black Lion Trading Company, which is sort of like a lore reason for the gem store and the trading post to exist but there's that he's always been around it's just most people don't know he's been around and then there's inspector keel or ellen keel need first name and keel's been around since south sun came out yes the first south sun yep so she's been around for a while and she was pretty like critical in the story for the living story in um, not only South Sun but the Aether Blade Retreat, and was she involved with Flame and Frost? I don't think she was. She was not because it was out of her jurisdiction. Yeah. Okay. That was so Bram she's, and Frost's she's story. been in all the living story except for Flame and Frost. Yeah. So I mean, she's obviously a very like ingrained character as far as the living story goes. She's kind of interesting too. She's not really a Traherne type, is she? No. Which blew my mind when she first came out because Arena has a tendency of making heroes very what's the word I'm looking for? Mary Sue-ish? Yeah. That's they, exactly. They love their heroes and think that they're awesome and they want you to as well. But at the same point, because they make them so, like, perfect and heroic, you just, like, can't connect with them. That's a good point. Now, Ellen Keel, on the other hand, pretty different. In fact, I would say that the last three... This is an interesting thing uh, that I actually wanted to talk about a little bit. Izzy bought, uh, Izzy on Twitter. Izzy bought. she's been on the show a few times. You're probably familiar with her? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was ta she was tweeting about female characters in video games, and I was thinking on Guild Wars Two, and I was like, you know, the last three major female characters that they've been introduced are sort of this interesting subsect or cross section of female characters in video games. Because you have Ellen Keel, you have Majorie Delacroix, and you have uh, Casimir, Lady Casimir, mm -hmm. and Casimir's the blonde bombshell with the skimpy armor. Uh, Ellen Keel, sort of the strict, you know, sort of the, you know, sticks to her guns. Sticks to the to her guns, but yet still follows the rules. Uh, and then because, there's Delacroix. And then there's Delacroix, <laughs> who sticks to her guns, but she's more of the roguish type uh, scoundrel. She has her own set of morals. Yeah, yeah, I would say that she still ascribes to the greater morals of the. Of Tyria, the moral system that that the humans of Tyria ascribe to, whatever that may be, uh, because obviously she worked against uh, the the corruption that is in Divinity's Reach. Mm -hmm. But she is still very much more scoundrelish in that I don't think Ellen Keel would necessarily stop working for the Lion Guard if she thought they were doing something wrong. She would fight it until someone mm -hmm. offed her. Whereas Delacroix was like, no, I'm out. I'm, yeah. I'm doing my own thing because you guys suck. She's much more renegade, basically. Yes. So, what do you think about that? Um, first of all, this reeks of the people that wrote the original personal story are probably not writing the story now. <laughs> either that or they've gotten a whole lot better which I'm hoping for the second but I'm pretty convinced it's the first <laughs> other yeah. than that I mean 
it's it's hard to say because without that time frame and knowing where they really plan on taking these characters, you can't really analyze them. Yeah. You can just like kind of skim the surface and be like, okay, well, they are what they are. Yeah. But we don't really have a rich backstory on like their origins, what all their motivations are, and whatnot. I mean, on the surface, Keel seems a very strong female character, but that's because we don't really know her motivations yet. If that makes yeah. sense, I mean, sure, we know she like wants to do for the better good of Lion's Arch, but we don't know why she wants to do that. Right? Is it just because she's a inherently good, perfect character, or is it because of uh, yeah, finding? I think discovering her motivations and eventually slowly uncovering weaknesses in the character and that sort of thing could be very fascinating. And I think that because of how they're rolling out the character, we can have some interesting getting to know the character it, because right now it's very much so like you've been you know you get introduced to someone for the first time and you pretty much have your first impressions and if you've met someone mm -hmm. and they are it's a good first impression you're not necessarily going to learn all of their weaknesses right away that's going to be something that you're not going to be looking for them yeah and with this <clears throat> excuse me with the election that they're doing now this should be a very interesting way to show off her weaknesses not only for um, Ellen, but they could introduce Majorie Delacroix to kind of be a behind the scenes, trying to get votes for her kind of person. A power player. Just, exactly. And the same thing with Evan Nashblade. They can show off his weaknesses. And I his mean, strengths. He's, he's greedy. Yeah. But, uh, like the way they've presented the politics so far it's very I, I don't want to say it but it's very reminiscent of recent American politics so it, it's interesting. I'm not going to ask so, you which one you think is Obama and which one you think no no not, not, not in that <laughs> oh, way not even that more oh, okay. in the way of attacking your opponent rather yep. than building yourself up they've done that actually for a really long time Look, you should have in the seen... grand scheme of things, the so the last hilarious thing is recent. Well, that's true. The last two hundred years, it's it's actually been a thing in American politics. You should read some of the stuff about like when um, when John Adams was running for president the first time, and like John the thing. Adams has so much to do about Guild Wars too. John Adams was like the third president, so we're going on. This has happened for a long time in America. But anyways, moving back into Guild Wars two, uh, there's stuff. So. I think it is fascinating, the politics that they're actually playing to, and the fact that it, it will, is going to not only affect the living story, what, he, what the players choose will affect the living story, but it's also going to affect the world in some ways. What exactly are they doing with that? Well, <laughs> do, do you want me to start with the big ones or the little ones? Let's grow it. Okay. So, temporarily, if Evan Nashblade ends up being the new head honcho, well, not head honcho, but one of the head honchos of Lion's Arch. A new it, counselor. There be a, hmm? a new counselor, if you will. Counselor. One of, the, one of the head honchos. Yeah. That's what I like to call them. There would be a four-week price cut on Black Lion Keys. Yay. So mm -hmm. excited. Hmm. <laughs> On the flip side of that, if it's Inspector Keel, we will get a four-week price cut on waypoints, which is Ooh, actually useful. That is actually kind of nice. How much so, do we know what the price cut is? We have no idea, and it's still temporary. So Nice. Mm. Eh. In the future, though, and this is a bit more permanent, each one is going to fund research into a new fractal. There's one other think, thing that they're doing, though. The fractal's kind of the biggest thing, would you, wouldn't you? you say? Or would you say the mm -hmm. other one's bigger? Are, oh! Oh! <laughs> Face Sorry. Ball. Well, the thing is, they said that each one is going to like reintroduce activities that we've seen before. Right. But listed on the site, they both have the same activities. 
Hmm. So maybe they've got some wiggle room. They have similar platforms, and what's going to happen is they can diverge as 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 ArenaNet starts listening and the campaign teams for the two sides begin ramping up. Could be. That's why I'm voting for Team Farron. I'll explain that later. <laughs> Team Farron. Oh, he doesn't have a ship. He's not a captain. We'll get not to that as well. Under speculators, th when I put this on. I will tell you why Farron's going to win. But anyways, please continue. So, they're both talking about the same activities, but then the big thing, the massive thing, the thing that everyone's like, oh my goodness! What is it? The new fractals that they are going to research and will be out by the end of the year. Or, well, they say the end of the year. I think about four-month turn time is what they were su suggesting. So, it would it be like, yeah. Well, they did say it took them, like, what, eight weeks to do all the fractals Except that are it, already out? Yeah. I think they're planning on a four-month, because they are. There's, there's actually three things that are happening that are huge that will... Yeah. I mean, th we're getting three new fractals, people. Well, there's four potential ones. Yes. Two set in stone are the Molten Facility and the Aether Blade Retreat. Indeed. Those are coming, no matter what. It's quite exciting. The other two are to be decided, or to be announced, depending on which one you want to use. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, who wins this upcoming election? If it's Evan Nashblade, we will get the fall of Abaddon. That being when humans got limited magic and Abaddon was all like, oh, everyone yeah. should have all this This magic. is God creation. Like, oh, realm of torment. Yeah. This is so creation of the bloodstones separation of the bloodstones creation of the marganites as the cursed race creation of the crystal desert timeline like grenth is a still a young god just he's the... not technically a god yet was he post abaddon no because they left right after no he was a god at that point he was he was fully ascended he had already taken out doom doom actually like the whole abaddon helped i believe with the whole grenth thing I thought Abaddon was helping Doom get out. I think it's because he wanted to... Because, well, see, the thing is, he would have been helping Doom get out because before that, he was still working with the gods. You know, he was part of the Six. And he was like, oh, we're replacing Doom. But then later, after he got trapped, you know, and then... to find a way to weaken the bear. Okay. And so if you can take out the God of Death and weaken that... That's one of... Now he only has to deal with four of five. Mm -hmm. And if he's got Doom on his side, Doom was the strongest. Yeah. Although, then there's Menzies as well, who was trying to take over Balthazar's, but... Yeah, but that, that's a different that fight. Mentioned. Yeah, that's that's from the that's from the human's homeworld, I think. I think that's the human's ho original pantheon that Menzies no, is a part of. No, because Menzies is... Half brother of Balthazar. Indeed. And Balthazar, what did Balthazar bring from the humans' homeworld? His father's head. Wait, what? I didn't know this. Really? So when Balthazar came, so first, uh, Melandru, first Melandru comes to Tyria theoretically, and he she shows up and she starts doing the shaping and stuff. Dwayna shows up. Probably they've been there before, but like when this is the order that they settled. Not necessarily the order that they first, like, appeared. So Melandra comes and starts doing her work. Then Balthazar shows up, and he's got the head of his father, and he's got his two hounds, and he comes to the plant. And then Dwayna shows up, and she brings the humans with her after everything's been prepped. So the suggestion is that there was a massive war between the pantheons on the human homeworld that destroyed that planet or wrecked it beyond to the point where humans were basically refugees. Dwayna saves what sh the people who are loyal to the Six, to mm -hmm. Abaddon, Doom, uh, Lissa, uh, Melandru, and, and brings them to this, to Tyria. Mm -hmm. And so, Menzies is fighting Balthazar because... Dude, you killed our dad. You helped ruin our war our homeworld. You took the humans that were worshiping us away. I can actually kind of understand why Menzies is kind of pissed. Yeah, but 
do we know that they have a shared father? Because I, I... Right, half-brother. It could be shared mother. Yeah. I would assume shared father. That tends to be the more the way that it goes with the whole Zeus, the Greek-style pantheon. Yeah. But it is a reunion, and they are known to break convention. That's true. <laughs> they could have the same. They could share a mother. Maybe it's Duena. Maybe, that's what I was about to say. Maybe it's Duena. <laughs> because because I, I always thought that Duena was Balthazar's mother, considering she's Grant's mother. That's true. Oh, so wait, does that make Grant and Balthazar half brothers? Weird. Oh. Snap. That must be some awkward family reunion. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Balthazar killed his dad, so he probably. I mean, it's probably more weird, like when Mal the spirit of Malkor Malkor shows up, and he's yeah, like, "Friends, like, like my dad was really crazy <laughs> and obsessed." <laughs> So he so Melkor shows up at the table and he's like carving Dwayna after, you know, Grenth has already started to be grown and then he turns to Balthazar, he's carving Balthazar's statue and he's like, So Balthazar, are you ready to call me daddy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now that we've gone there, let's get back to the discussing the actual stuff that's coming out. So Abaddon, Fall of Abaddon, that's exciting. It would be fantastic to actually see like I'm imagining a fractal where you are doing something, fighting Marganites in the Crystal Desert with, and, and your theory is awesome too, which is why you're going second, with the gods' full-on colossus-sized avatars just beating the crap out of each other in the background. But you've got a different theory. Well, here's my train of thought. There's five gods. The party size is five. Oh, snap! So, it could be a thing of we, like, load in, and there's, like, just a room with five pedestals, and each player has to choose one, and you become an avatar of the, this whatever god you choose. <laughs> so, like... That's interesting. Now, would you lose your skills, or do you think your skills would just receive an additional bonus based on what you took? They go both ways with it. Personally, I want to see something along the lines of every class has, well, not class, profession. This isn't wow. That's right. Get it straight. <laughs> every profession has a different set of abilities for every god so you really have to plan out okay oh. do we really want the guardian to be Duena? because if he's Balthazar we'll not only have the guardian support but he'll get like all this other burning stuff and hounds and whatever it's like do we want the thief to be with Le Lesson or Grenth yeah that's a good point. Oh, the, the choice between the classic assassin philosophies of Guild Wars. Here's the thing. If you take Dwayna, you get to heal. Like, just straight up healer. Which is why the necromancer needs to take Dwayna's spot. <laughs> what? Why? Because necromancers are the best healers in Guild Wars. Hands down. Yeah, that is true. I know, right? I always thought that was hilarious. <laughs> it makes no sense. It's, true. <laughs> it's because they have unlimited energy. It's beautiful. It's like, oh, you guys are out of energy? I'm just going to keep healing for full. Just keep uh, killing stuff. Soul reaping is good. So oh, as long as you have a full soul reaping bar, you can just, like, it acts like initiative, and you just insta-cast all of your spell, all of your healing spells, and you're just like, bam, 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 AoE healing, AoE healing. Yeah. Receive the light. Receive the necromantic healing. Which they still need to add life siphon or uh, siphon as a uh, condition in Guild Wars 1. Or Guild Wars 2. Yeah. Like or, at a, or like a life stealing boon. Mm -hmm. you think or it should well, be a stealing condition. It makes more sense for it to mob. be a condition. Yeah. So that'd be interesting. What yeah. is Ellen Keel's? Well, or, well, yeah, keep, keep a going. A little bit more with Fall of Abaddon. We have no idea where exactly this is taking place. Because, as far as we know, the fall, like, the war between the Pantheon and Abaddon 
spanned a huge territory. That's a good point. From Iran to the Crystal Desert. Yeah. And possibly beyond. Yeah. Well, at the time it was the Crystal Sea. I mean, I need to make sure. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't a desert then. It, it wasn't was an ocean. No fell. Now, you could take the whole Fall of Abaddon title literally where he fell into a hole which would mean that he fell into the realm of torment which would place it in the crystal sea meaning we would see plenty of Marganites because they were ship people I just looked at chat. Yeah, that's that's Perfect. some interesting stuff. The, the the fact that we also don't know how the fall actually occurred. Exactly. We know he was trapped, but not sure how. That's a good point. Also, we don't have a guarantee that we're going to be playing the good guys in this fight. Exactly. We could be playing Marganites. Which and now and now they release a Marganite tonic cuz everyone loves those. I like them. They're kind I, of fun. I really don't think so because how would you have success parameters for that? You don't die as fast. <laughs> right? Yeah, that makes you sense. You have to survive this long and then your party gets wiped out. <laughs> I think we've done those before. There was there, I've done one of those, like a dungeon where it's like, don't fail so bad. <laughs> I think it was. I think what, Caverns of Time. I think had that one. No, no. You always win. Nah. See, games are too much wish fulfillment. We need some failure. Just so the closest thing I can think of is that mission in Guild Wars Factions, where you like go through it, you get to Shiro, and in the cutscene he just like destroys everyone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's right. Like... He kills us. And then they're like, Nope, nope. You're not dead yet. It's cool. I remember the first time I saw that. I'm just like. What? What's what's going on? The thing is, they didn't really have good enough animations for you to understand that you had died when I was watching that. <laughs> and I was like, wait, am I dead? Why are they talking? Like, it, was a, it took me the second time watching it to go, oh, I died there! That's why I can see the gatekeepers! <laughs> oh! That makes sense. But, yeah, that's... That's interesting i look forward i would very much like to see that unfortunately it's tied to evan nashblade what does evan keel what does ellen keel offer us she is going to look into research of the happenings of the thalma nova reactor which is a former inquest base linked strongly with some not all elder dragons and and it's Steam probably universe. the biggest, well, well, not biggest, but one of the biggest mysteries in Guild Wars 2 right now. Really? Yeah, we, we, we don't know why it blew up, how exactly we blew up, it blew up, like, why were the Inquest even there? We know, like, in the grand scheme of things, we know nothing about it. And because, as we established, the Inquest was derived from a person that was started essentially by a Azura that was studying the gods aspects which took the form of dragons uh, watch the wooden potatoes video about on Guild Wars 2 mysteries it's it's fantastic it's worth watching uh, that yeah I mean this could be tying the gods to the dragons and actually giving us the oh snap they're the same thing I I don't think they're the same thing. No, I don't I think so. I do either, think that, that they cool. kind of draw from the same power because when you have that much power Well look at how the dragon the dragons just the dragons it could be two sides of the same coin. It could be a subconscious or it could be an affliction of the gods or a subconscious like a secondary personality that surfaces within them. Because as you can see, Zaitan can easily take control of the god's powers as we established in or yeah yeah or is it not that he's taking control of the power but he's just using his own to mimic it oh that's a good counter 
That's a good point. Because as we've established, necromancers can burn things. So he could definitely copy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the necromancer burn is called Doomfire. That is fantastic. I'm such a fan of that. My uh, Rabin will not use it because he's like, I'm not going to use something that Doom designed. That's a horrible plan. Which it really is. I think that every time, that at some point, if we ever go to the underworld, Doom's going to wake up again. Not because we killed so much stuff, but because so many necromancers are channeling Doomfire. Well, the thing with <laughs> that, Doom. That he's going like, to wake up and he's like, what, what's going on, guys? The thing with he, Doom, though? He, going on with that, I mean, it's really apparent just like around the Shadow Behemoth area that the links to the underworld are getting really, really weak. That's a good point. And it could be that Doom has started to gain enough power to start breaking the seals again. Well, just like in Guild Wars 1. Well, and the gods are gone. Like, we don't know where they went. And people haven't gone to their realms, so they don't know if Grunt's throne is empty. If Balthazar's left his... I mean, if the gods are gone, gone, there's no one watching Doom's cell. Except for, like, the well, minions King, of Grunt. Well, and, and Frozen. But they're not going to be able to do anything. King Frozen, when we know, is still there. Well, yeah. So he's, he's got our back. He came back again, actually, for the Wicker Wind Festival. You guys should check, look that up. It's, hopefully we'll do that again someday. It was fun. Play a run event on an EU server. It was good. Anyways, so Keel is going to be looking into that, uh, into the Thermonova reactor. And this brings up in the most interesting thing, I think, about the politics of it. They are tying characters who we may... Like, for example, I would be more inclined to vote for Ellen Keel. Except for the fact, I really want to see the fall of Doom. And I think that they did... A, Doom. Uh, not Doom. Abaddon. <laughs> I, because, I think it's fascinating because what they've done is they've taken all of their old guard of Guild Wars players who really like the lore and who have stuck with Guild Wars 2 because they really like the lore and various other things and said, hey, you guys, you want to vote for this guy, for Evan Nashblade, but, and, and we lore guys are like, but we don't want to vote for Evan Nashblade. No one wants to vote for Evan Nashblade. He's a greedy jerk. And then they're like, but look at the candy he has. It, it's politics. It's brilliant. I think Arena has done a fantastic job because immediately it went from, oh, it's going to be Ellen Keel, to it could go either way. I, I still think it's going to be Ellen Keel because yeah. they're, I mean, even among the lore people for, like, Guild Wars 1, like myself, sort of, there's going to be those that are just like, you know what, thumb and over reactor. Yeah. That's true. Oh my God. I think it's going to be... F well, and, I mean, there's also the mystery of the steam creatures that started showing up in Tyria after Thermonova reactors exploded, which I think is fascinating. And we're going to get back to... At, so, it's, at some point in the, tonight, we're going to get back to discussing alternate realities of Tyria and what that means for us as players. Because there's some fascinating stuff that Colin Johansson said earlier today about, about just right that. Content. Huh? It's going to be raid content. I think that going to the... I, that would actually be amazing if this ended up being... If, like, either the Fall of Abaddon or the Thermonova Reactor were their first raids. Because uh, I think what's going to happen... They said that they're revamping how... Uh, how the fractals work on some level. Mm -hmm. And I think what's going to happen is there's going to be actual portals where you can pick. You're like, do you want to go through the random fractals... Which eventually, you know, and, and do that. Or do you want to go to these specific fractals? And you're going to be able to choose which fractal you go to. Like, okay, I'm going to do the Aetherblade fractal. I'm going to do the uh, the Fla Frost and Flame Dredge fractal. I'm going to do the other one. The only bad thing I could see about that system is that if the rewards are the same for both of them, like, going random versus picking, everyone's going to pick the easiest fractals. Yes. And just farm them. Yes, I think that there will be different rewards per, for it. Uh, and I think I think that the random fractals, the those, I think that content will stay the way that it is. 
and I think that you will have different new rewards that you can get through these new fractals that they're putting in. And maybe it will be a one path fractal that randomizes between the three new fractals because I suspect that because they're longer than a normal fractal first of all. So well, we don't know that yet because they could be redesigning it where that's true. it's just you know a little bit of trash, a mini boss, a little bit more trash than the big boss. Yeah. That's a good point. That is yeah. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see what they do with that, and it's interesting that they've decided to to tie that because I I do think Ellen Keel will win just because another thing that they're doing is because they're letting us pick the next counselor. That's gonna affect how the council makes decisions in Lion's Arch. I mean, just from a and a, a arena that's good enough with their world lore that you know that it's gonna actually play mm. out. Like that's gonna be a major player how do you think that either how do you think that they would affect the council how do you think nashblade would affect the council if if he was elected it would be much more commerce driven obviously i mean that's without a given and with that we probably see a lion's arch more like a wall street sort of Okay. environment rather than the free trade mecca that it is now where anyone is welcome and all this mm. it'd be more like oh hey this section of lion's arch is for the really wealthy people this is where these pirates go this is where these pirates go These. this is like the player place like for these heroes and what not and I don't know it, it, it's they can go many different directions with it because I mean we know very little about Evan Nashblade ultimately just that he's the big honcho of the Black Lion Trading Company yeah he that's true and, and there it, would be riots there would I uh Asith is hoping that there will be anti-char riots in uh, in Occupy Ebon Hawk. Lion's Arch. Occupy Ebon Hawk. Occupy Lion's Arch against uh, Evan uh, against Evan. Uh, what do you think Ellen Keel would do? I think. How do you think she will affect the Lion's Arch and affect the living story going forward? I could definitely see there being a standing army after she comes in, if her influence becomes great enough, like a serious standing army. Really? Mm -hmm. Like, m becoming another one of the major... I mean, they're kind of... Yeah. Oh, I wow. could see Lion's Arch becoming a nation, not just a city. Not just a city in Crit in Krita. Mm-hmm. Huh. That would make sense. Oh, that could be very interesting. It'll, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with it, because I think ArenaNet is going to take this and play it to the hilt. Because... Oh, yeah. I mean... Did you play... You played it, uh, WoW in Cataclysm and Wrath of Lich King, right? Yeah, I played all and, the way up to when Deathwing came out. Imagine if they had given the Horde the chance to vote between Cairn and Garrosh Hellscream. Just think about how and different... And Vol'jin. Just think about... Well, yeah, Vol'jin would have won because he's awesome. Actually, no, Cairn would have because of all the Peacenik cow people. But anyways... No, it would have actually been a really tight race between Vol'jin and Garrosh. Yeah, <laughs> Garrosh would not have won. How strange. <laughs> Campfire would have won before Garrosh. <laughs> Which is funny, because they're getting rid of him now. Well, maybe. But anyways, this isn't a WoW podcast, as much as I sometimes think it would be hilarious if it was. Uh, but, I mean, that's. I think it's a fascinating thing that they're letting the players actually move story. It's, it's not quite sandbox. But it's getting there. Well, the th the thing is, it's Sam. It's themed with hints of sandbox. Yes. And if anyone can pull it off, I think it's Arena Net because they have these specific writers that names cannot. I know faces, but not names. What? Yeah. Are well, they've got Jeff Grubb names? and they've got Reese Osby, yes. who are Thank both you. fantastic world builders. Uh, from everything I've seen, and. I've been following a lot of the uh, a few of the writers on Twitter, 
John Peters and John John Peters no John Ryan I think John J Ryan is one yeah mm -hmm. John Ryan and Peter Freeze and they are both hilarious on Twitter and I they have some really good prosaic tweets when they're when they're actually you know decided I'm gonna write a tweet that's gonna be awesome and so I think that there's they incorporate what's nice is they incorporate a lot of humor in the tweeting and in the and and it but it's not pop culture humor like you know how guild wars for a while became very pop culture driven for their humor yeah that was i didn't like that in nightfall not gonna lie yeah no i i mean and as funny as drake's on a plane was i mean that i'm not gonna lie that's just like sitting there and it's like we have a plane and we have all these drakes I can accept that. There were a lot more where it's just like, really? Really? That, no. Banana scythe. There was a banana scythe? Yes. That's just sad. I never saw that, and I'm glad. <laughs> so, the the thing is, their humor is very able to translate into Guild Wars 2 without dragging pop culture references along with it, and I think that that's going to be good for them. Mm -hmm. In the long run, for sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, look at WoW. They have plenty of pop culture references, but the ones from Vanilla, people, like, walk by them, and they're just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, in Vanilla, no. it was so sparse, and it and it got more and more it, and more as BC, they... And in BC, even, like, yeah. Ophara, Wind Fury, the Innkeeper. Okay. Wait, is that a thing? Oh, Oprah yeah. Winfrey. Ah! That's good. It took me a while, and by took me a while, I never noticed that before. I never actually looked at the oh. names of innkeepers. I was just like, I need rested experience bonus. I'm going to sleep here. And then they're like, would you like something to drink? I'm like, sure, I'll take something to drink. And that was pretty much my entire interaction with an innkeeper. She's in wow. the Draenei innkeeper at Hellfire Peninsula in the area that's like in the northwest. That would explain... That would explain why I have no clue, because Horde, man. Horde all the way. You weird lying well, scum. O I mean, Ophara Windfury had to be a Draenei. I mean... I guess. Caregiver. Gives give stuff away. Had yeah, to be a that's a good point. I'll give you that. Alright, moving on, though. There is a lot of stuff to work. So how is the election going to actually work? What's going to happen with this? Okay. So there's going to be activities, and there's going to be drops, and there's going to be support tokens. So people that are active will be able to use these support tokens to show their support for their selected candidate. Now, what we do not know is if you can use support tokens for one and then the other, for one and then the other if you want. Just be like, hey, you can have some, and you can have some. Everyone gets support tokens, or if once you pick a candidate, all your support tokens go to that candidate, which I would assume is what most people are going to do anyways. But it's very interesting because this shows that the people that are more active in the game and get more support tokens are going to have a much heavier role in the decision for which candidate will actually win. Yeah, that's true. And so that could be very interesting because the, are the lore buffs more active? Are the WV dubbers more active? Are the SPV peers more active? Well, will SPV the SPV peers yeah. even show up? Well, actually, the question is, will WV dubbers and SPV peers even know that there's an election going on? Probably if Indo and Indo's friends are any indication, no. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they, the most of them, they're like, what? They're like, what's, what's this PVE stuff? Why, why would I go do that? That's dumb. You mean the place I load into before I go to the Eternal <laughs> Battlegrounds? <laughs> it's so true. Uh, we love you guys from WV Dub, but we're, I'm definitely a PVE -er at heart, right here. Actually, it could be here. Maybe I... Never mind. That's a, like a weird Ninja Warrior reference. Moving on. I think it'll be fascinating to uh, see how that works out. And it'll be also interesting to see because Colin Johansson did say that they were going to bribe people. 
Like, there is a high probability of bribes happening for people to turn in look, votes. Look, I'm not going to lie. If Evan Nash plays, is like, hey, hey, I'll give you 50 silver for a support token. I'll be like, here you go. <laughs> Done. Just, just putting <laughs> that in right here, right? With the one that says Evan on it? Okay, bam. That's a good I'll, point. I'll sign in and everything. Kill's like, I'll give you a puppy. And then it's like a puppy cookie. A puppy cookie. Or no, mini pets. Mini Kill pets. pets. <laughs> Actually, no, no, no. There's another person who's going to be giving away mini pets. But uh, I'll get to that during our... Our... Uh, really only free... We w we can be bribed by 50 silver for a single support token, Fraben. It's true. Yeah. Because it's only one. <laughs> it, so yeah. 150 other ones can go to the other person. I'm like, mm. <laughs> it, it really, you pay for every single one. Think how much gold that would be. Oh, that'd be amazing. I'm really looking forward to uh, to seeing what happens with that. There's also the possibility. Uh, let's. I'm. I, nope. We've already talked about the fractals. Man, we have uh, we have epic notes. We really need to have spirit write shorter <laughs> things. So what other what other so we've got another event actually that's coming out with the uh, Cutthroat Politics, which is a challenge mission. It sounds like where you enter the candidate trials alone or with a group, and you fight off waves of Aetherblade pirates, which sounds very similar to classic challenge missions in Guild Wars, doesn't it? Or the Winter's Day event. That's a good point. Do you think it will be more like the Winter's Day event where it's a very set number of waves, or do you think that this is going to be an unlimited number of waves with a ranking system? I'd prefer it to be an unlimited number of waves with a ranking system, but I have a feeling because they're probably going to tie achievements to it and whatnot that it's going to be a set number. Because they already have the scaling system in Fractals where they can scale enemies' health add more enemies, all those sorts of things. So they've sort of got the tech in there that they could, each wave, just keep adding more until there's no mathematical way that you can win. Mm -hmm. and, and then, like, after you've cleared 50 waves, and you're fighting hundreds of them, and like, I, I don't know how these people are surviving, then they start adding in agony pulses every few times, and eventually those become unavoidable. So it ends with, like, the people with just ridiculous agony. Basically, the people who clear, like, level 80 fractals. Are level the 80 fractals don't exist. What's the highest level fractal? Like, 50. Okay, level the, the, the level <laughs> 50 fractal people are the ones who are basically, like, clearing it. Because everyone else is getting, you know, pretty awesome rewards. And these guys are like, I got 30 precursors for clearing level 150. <laughs> that would be amazing. We would we would clear hundred level one hundred fifty if it gave a guaranteed precursor. <laughs> we would fight. We would take five guardians in there if we. Had I would to. take a week off from work. No, <laughs> I wouldn't actually. But <laughs> yes, we would. We all have guardians. Why not? I think spam, that that would be spam F two. That would Do be. A... <laughs> <laughs> so here's the here's the question: Do you think it's going to be permanent content, or do you think this is just for the? Uh... I'm I'm convinced it's going to be just for this because it's so heavily tied into it. It, just, oh, but it sounds so awesome. Like, th could we this... might see another iteration of it. That's like point. down the line, but as far as like it, it's Aether Blade Pirates for once. It's for support tokens. It's for new weapons that are tied to the Aether Blades. I am fairly certain that this is going to be temporary content. That's a good point. And speaking of content though that is coming back that's been reworked a little bit they've reworked a beta event an event that was at the end of uh, what beta 1 or beta 2 Ooh, beta 2 beta and 1 was the uh, like animals and stuff that's right oh Black giant Black legendary Black. The, the broken rabbit event legendary rabbit legendary rabbit that took ha ha 45 minutes to kill so yeah, tell tell us about these these two events that are going to be uh, coming in with this. The first one is South Sun Survival, which is a remake of the Beta Two event. Or wait, was it two or three? It was either Beta Two or Three. Then okay, it one was or the other. Two. Which I don't is know. their Hunger Games equivalent, because they a bunch of nerds at ArenaNet. 
Nards. It's a pretty fantastic. Like <laughs> it turned out to be a really good mini game, though. I'm not gonna I, lie. Mm -mm. I logged okay. out. I was just like, I am not having this. And then oh. I logged back in, and I was the only one still alive that was in a robot. And I was just like, what? I win. <laughs> <laughs> It that was broke. Good. It was broke, like, to all, to high heaven. Because you could use yeah. a tonic I mean, a, and yeah. be back in the game. It was hilarious. That's how people won. But basically, it's going to be this event in South Sun. Yes. So, I mean, we pretty much, I mean, they're obviously going to rework it a little bit, probably, because that event takes forever, and they're going to want it to be, you know, maybe like 15 minutes. Somewhere along those lines. What if it's not? What if they do it like so World vs. World? Very, very little people playing it. What if they do it where you go in, and there's objectives for you to complete, you have to survive for X amount of time, and forget World vs. World, what if they do it like World Wars, uh, not World War Z, but uh, what's what's the mod for Arma 2? DayZ. What if they do it like DayZ? You go in, you, f you start with very minimal stuff, and you try and survive for as long as possible. Then, like, how would they determine rewards? Uh, you find stuff, and so as you're exploring, as you're finding, like, things, there's going to be random stuff that pops up. Killing an enemy player is going to be giving you rewards. It's, it's all from doing stuff. It's not at the end of the match. When you die, you don't get a reward because staying alive lets you build up the rewards you have. And that will scale based on how long you've been alive as well. So you get better and better rewards, but Sounds the longer you're really, alive. Really like, oh, this is just begging to be exploited. Territory. It's true. It could be. It could be something that could be exploited. Maybe. Maybe it's not huge rewards. Maybe it's. Maybe it's something that it's like you go in there because playing a survival mini game in Guild Wars is something you find interesting. I have to wonder how many people would actually do that. I would do that. It would be fun. I'd get Shongaku and I'd get Vrabin and we'd like go in and we'd be like, "We're surviving," and then then I'd shoot Vrabin in the back and be like, "Now I win." It would be fantastic. And then, and then I'd, I'd be like, Evie, come survive in South Sun with me. And you'd like zone in and I'd headshot you. And I'd be like, Ned, table flip. <laughs> <I'm out." laughs> and then I'd be like, Saikov, Saikov, bring Shongakov in. And then I'd hunt him across the map. And he'd be you running around. Person. People would come like to attack him and I'd kill him. And then I'd like take him down to like one health and let him get away. Fantastic. You are a horrible person. <laughs> so now you know why I want to actually play that. Because the funny thing is, I'm so bad at games that this would never actually happen. Like, people would just instantly kill me. <laughs> you, you, but you'd, I can dream. You'd spawn in, and someone would headshot you from across the zone. I'm not gonna no, curse you lightning skills from the lightning elemental. And your stupid signet of unlimited range. <laughs> Which they actually fixed, so they can't use that okay. anymore. Mwahaha. So that's, that should be... I think it'll be interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. There is something else that they're releasing as well. Another, another mini-game called Aspect Arena. That this could be interesting. Describe See, it. I love me some Dragon Ball. It was pretty fantastic. I love fantastic. me some Sanctum Sprint. And this is basically both of them put together. Now, here's the here's the question that I have for it. So Dragon Ball was yeah, Dragon Ball was amazing. Sanctum Sprint I mean aside from the horrible rewards. Sanctum Sprint was amazing just from a like jumping puzzle race Mario game Kart wise, mix. It's it was fantastic. Probably the best mini game they've put out. It's amazing. If you have not played Sanctum Sprint, why are you watching this show? Go play it now. We'll wait for you. Okay, we waited long enough. Okay, yeah, so, so you can pause it and then start up again. <laughs> <clears throat> With Aspect Arena, there's a much more direct PvP. Yeah. Like, As opposed to the trolling Just PvP like of Dragon Sanctum Ball, Sprint. But yes. With the, like, momentum and just craziness that is Sanctum Sprint. Yes. 
and I can't wait for it. Now, here's the thing, is they said that you will tune to one of three aspects and get some special skills based on that, or be able to create a build based on that on some level. I'm, it, I might be interpreting this wrong, but it sounded to me like there would be three teams. Did that sound like it to you, or do you think it's going to be just two teams, each with... I think it's going to be two teams, and each one's going to choose whatever they want. Oh, and so you'll basically get team comps of, like, three sun, two lightning, four wind. Well, it's probably going to be random, so it won't be anywhere near that organized. Oh, you don't think it's, that they'll it, do party-based? I, I hope so, but I doubt it. Yeah, that it'll be... I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. I would love to see three-team, uh, small-team combat. I think that'd be fascinating. Like, 5v5, v5. I'd, I'd actually rather see it 3v3v3. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, that'd be... Hmm. That could be interesting. 3v3v3. So, you could run with two of one element, one of another element, or all three different elements... Or all three or one element. The teams based on elements, so it's wind against sun against lightning. Oh, uh, yeah. There's. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with that. They, most of their mini games I've thought have been have been fun. I still haven't figured out keg brawl. I think I've been in it like four times, and I'm like, I don't understand what's <laughs> going on. Brawl, I'm terrible. It's, it's it's one. It's so easy to cheese it, and most people that are in there aren't even playing. They're just doing it for the achievements. And then the ones that actually are playing it are at such a level by now. There's no hope you are going to come anywhere near what they do unless you live and breathe Keg Brawl. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that, So, which is one reason why they should let you create pre-mades for their minigames. I think that's actually a big thing, because Sanctum Sprint, for example... I enjoyed win sharing after I after I had gotten my first place, and by gotten my first place, you helped a lot. Uh, it would be I was it would have been fascinating to get like eight relics of war people in there and gone like full out troll mode and just tried to destroy each other. Yeah, I mean, at, at a certain point, I was getting my twenty five races in for the achievement. And after I had gotten my third place, I had gotten my, you know, feet, I guess, wet. And I started getting first place after first place after first place after first place. And I was just like, uh, I should probably not get first place because there's no real incentive to do first place. Right, you didn't, you so didn't get I would, anything better. So I would literally, like, as before the race started, I'd be like, okay... I'm probably going to get first place. Nothing against you guys, and I'm not, like, trolling or anything. But if I do, I'm just going to stand there and wait for the next person. And the next person, and the next person. And I will go in fourth. Yeah. What I did is I just stopped caring about the race once I got 100%, once I got first place. And, and you, you were there for so many of those games. Huh? You still need to finish for the achievement, which is the only reason why right. I did it. Yeah, well, and the funny thing was, like, uh, what I started doing with the Sanctum Sprint was I just started, like, exploring. I went down <laughs> paths that made no sense. I, like, tried to, I, like, created mini achievements for myself. I'm like, I want to jump from there to there to there to there to there to there, and then run across that, then jump across the bamboo, and, like, full-on ninja backflip here. And so I created all of these convoluted things, and I was always, like, last place because I was doing all this wonky stuff and then I also would like follow the worst person on the map and like watch them and just sort of stare at them I think they th I, I my thought last three matches that's what I did and I was just like you shouldn't go this way you should go the other way <laughs> oh did they listen you to you jump this beam not try to roll that way did they listen to you no Oh, it's like the spider event that we did earlier this week with the poor people. Just so you guys know, there is a guild rush where you turn into spiders. What you can do is the spiders can teleport across the vat distances. There is one spot where you go through a, go through some gates, and you can go all the way around and get back to the next gates. Or you can just go through the gates... Jump and use the spider jump to go straight to the next gates, go through them, and then just keep walking. We watched two guilds do this, where they would go through those first 
those first those gates and then just go all the way around and i'm sitting there in my spot and i got a spider just to try and teach them and i stood and i sat there and i was like teleporting back and forth just constantly teleporting back and forth hoping that it that someone would get it and then finally someone from the other guild like they stopped they brought their spider back and i teleported a few more times and they just sort of looked at it and then their st spider started walking towards the edge